Hello, everybody, and welcome to Food for Thought. Before we begin today's presentation, I have a few quick announcements for you. The first is that we've recently opened our new temporary exhibit, Justice Not Favor, Alabama Women and the Vote. It'll be on view from now until May 31st, 2022. You can come see it as the building is open Monday through Saturday, 8.30 to 4.30. I'd also like to invite you to join us on September 28th at noon Central Standard Time for a virtual gallery talk in Justice Not Favor in honor of National Voter Registration Day. So that will be right here on our Facebook or YouTube page. I'd also like to invite you next month as we continue our Food for Thought series, when Joseph Caver comes to talk on October 21st on From, from Marion to Montgomery, the early years of Alabama State University, 1867 to 1925. Today, it is my honor to welcome Dr. Andrew Frank. Dr. Frank is a professor of history at Florida State University, specializing in the history of the Florida Seminoles and the Native South. In addition to numerous book chapters and journal articles, Dr. Frank is the author of Before the Pioneers, Indian Settlers, Slaves, and the Founding of Miami, and Creeks and Southerners, by Culturalism in in the early American frontier, which is available in our online bookstore. We'll provide a link for you below so you can purchase it. Welcome, Dr. Frank. Well, thank you, Alex, for that really nice introduction. And thank you all for, I guess it's either tuning in or logging in um, for coming to hear me speak. Um, so what I'm gonna try to do today is a handful of things, but we're gonna talk about what I call the curious case of Kunti. Um, which is a food that is eaten in Florida for a very long time by indigenous people. Uh, for Civil War folks out there, um, if you're interested, Kunti was eaten by lots of Confederate soldiers in Florida. Um, lots of people got sick from it, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so let me start with the very beginning. Um, and I'm going to try to be consistent. Sometimes I'm not, but I'll be as consistent as I can between right, discerning the difference between food, which is the ingredients, and a recipe, which is more along the lines of, of, of a method. Right, there's a TV channel, Food Network, which is like hundreds of different TV shows, which is fundamentally the idea you can put the same ingredients of two different people and two different cultures, we'll figure out ways of putting them together differently. So ingredients may lend themselves to a particular culture, but we know that someone who is from French cuisine and someone who is from Latin America will take the same ingredients and imagine them in different ways. And so one of the ways what I'm gonna talk about food is not only what do people eat or what did the indigenous folks in the American South eat, but also how do they put them together and how do they reimagine um, food, recipes, mealtime. Um, and to, at the same time, I'm gonna try to get at this idea of who the Florida Seminoles actually are. And there is a conventional wisdom out there that Seminoles largely reject, at least Florida Seminoles largely reject, um, and they've convinced me to reject it as well. And the conventional wisdom is that the Seminoles in Florida once upon a time were creeks in Georgia, Alabama, and maybe even North Florida. And in the 1700s and early 1800s, especially early 1800s, groups of creeks broke off, moved into Florida, became Seminoles. And then during the 19th century Seminole Wars, first, second, third, from the 1812 or so until the 1850s, they slowly moved deeper and deeper to the South. But if you were to ask lots of Seminoles, they would say they've been here forever. And if they were to say like who their ancestors are, they would say some of our ancestors indeed follow that path from Georgia, Alabama, North Florida to the interior of Florida, to the wetlands, to the Everglades, to the Big Cypress Swamp, and to the plains of Alachua and further south, what is now University of Florida South. But they would also say that their ancestors were the Calusa and the Tequesta and the Timucua and indigenous folks who were in Florida at the moment that Europeans arrived. Um, and their ancestors were those individuals and their ancestors and their ancestors. So they've been here, um, as one seminal leader told me, like since dinosaur days, right? A euphemism for like what, what scholars will call the time before memory. And so I'm gonna use these two foods to try to imagine how we can think about seminals and, and food. And these are the two most traditional seminal foods. Um, one is safki um, and one is kunti. Um, I'm going to use Sofki as kind of a euphemism, if you will, for the American South or the Native South. It is a dish 
Normally corn is its most kind of core ingredient, corn, water, ash, but it is eaten slash drinking, drunk um, throughout the American South. Um, Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, Seminoles. Um, Sofki takes the Trail of Cheers out into Indian territory, and it remains kind of the staple food that is ubiquitous in the native South. Kunti, which may be new to many people, is different. Kunti, um, its actual name is derived from Florida. Um, some people have mischaracterized it as arrowroot, and there are other varieties of zamia. Um, but the particular form of zamia that the Seminoles eat is only indigenous to Florida, and it's a native Florida ingredient. And so we're going to try to reimagine like how this actually works and what we can learn from these two products. And to do that, we need to start with the native South, and now I'm going to include Florida as part of the South, but the rest of the South as a whole, the large Southeastern Indian nations that we imagine, the Muscogee and the Cherokee and the, uh, and, and the Seminole and the Choctaw and the Chickasaw, right? This was a world of, of women. It was a world of clans. It was matrilineal, um, which tells us about who people imagine their ancestors to be, who their kin is or who their kin are. So children look to their mothers, look to their mother's brother. They follow the maternal line to imagine who their family is. But perhaps more important to understanding it as a world of women, at least when it comes to food, is that women were both the producers as well as like the producers of the raw ingredients of a recipe. Um, they were in charge of cornfields. They were in charge of, of harvesting nuts and hunted meat. Um, but in terms of like caloric input and symbolic input into the meal, corn was corn, right? With capital C, capital O, capital R, capital N. You can't underestimate the importance of, of corn. And women were not only there in terms of harvesting and cultivating the fields, they were also there in the preparation of food. So in all the descriptions we have of Sofki in the American South, from the earliest moments that Europeans are observing it, up through basically the present, almost exclusively women are producing the corn and the sofki. And in most instances, when we see the corn and the sofki being eaten, it is eaten in the form of extended families. Um, and so clans are the folks who are consuming. So women go out, they go out into their own fields, they harvest their own corn, they come back into their village and the women collectively produce sofki for their clan, their extended family. So when we think about early Florida, which is my goal today to talk a little bit more about the Seminoles, but when we think about the South as a whole, but Florida in particular, we should think of it as a world of fields and a world of gardens, right? We are like, this is a, a obviously not a um, literal description of what, of what the, the Indians or their gardens or their fields look like. But I hope you can imagine that like this is intentionally drawn in such a way that we see women in the field doing the actual planting. Now in Florida, there are lots of descriptions where men would often go out in the field to help break the ground. Um, but the actual planting, the actual harvesting in Florida and elsewhere was almost always the exclusive domain of women. Women controlled the fields. And out of this comes a tremendous amount of power so if you could imagine, right, take the knowledge that you have about the indigenous South and, and think about women control everything that happens inside the village. They control the food that is eaten. They control the food both from like, what, from, from farm to table, right? To take on the modern parlance of, of the, the restaurant industry. Men hunted meat, they hunted deer and other animals. And so they harvested deer in that way, but those activities took them outside of the village. You had to leave home in order to hunt. So men were in charge of diplomacy. Uh, so they were the ones who had to deal with in the Florida context with the Spanish and the English and perhaps other indigenous villages. Um, but they took that took place outside. But the world inside the village was one defined by corn. Um, and so we can think about the green corn ceremony as being the most important, most ubiquitous um, ceremony in the Native South. It's one of these um, holidays isn't quite the right word, but it is a ceremony that is multiple days, each tribe, each nation celebrated and celebrates it slightly differently. But it's a ritual day of cleansing, where, or days of cleansing. And people come and they 
they camp in their clans, they congregate in their clans. Um, and it's the ritual of the green corn being like safe. It's time to celebrate, it's time um, to feast. And out of this world of fields, out of this world of gardens, comes Safki. And let me, like, so Safki comes from the Creek, uh, from the Creek language. And at its heart, Safki has a remarkably consistent, basic recipe, right? As with all recipes, there's lots of variation, but at its heart, Safki is coarsely ground corn, sometimes called cracked corn, but depending on where you go and what time you're looking at, um, it's coarsely ground corn, lots of water. I've heard like a six to one ratio is often what you see in terms of recipes, one cup of corn to six cups of water. So it's really, really loose. And then normally there's some sort of like ash from like tree, which has a lye in it or baking soda in the modern world, which kind of puffs it up a little bit. And you can see these are two images from the early 20th century, one mid 20th century, early 20th century on the top, mid on the bottom. Um, of seminal families getting together um, and eating safki on the top and on the bottom, a seminal woman uh, making safki. You can see this large spoon, which I hope you can imagine, gives it a sense that this is not for small bowls, this is for like collective. Um, it is a food that is drunk at pretty much any temperature, often warm, normally not very hot, but it can be almost exclusively cooked by women for their family in their camp um, in the Florida context as the villages become camps and a little bit smaller. Um, this is the domain of women. Now, as we look across time and across space, there are some varieties. Sometimes we see images of and recipes of indigenous folks adding guava or meat or seasoning. Uh, but for the most part, we're only talking about corn, water, baking soda, or ash. They drink it from morning until evening. Um, most of the descriptions we have um, of the native South are not people who ate three meals a day with a defined breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but rather they were folks who ate one meal a day, but safki what was, is what was consumed in order to keep basically one from having enough calories to survive, to get basically through the day. Um, so this pot, cooked by women is constantly being stirred throughout the day. More water may be added, more kofki may be made, but for the most part, right, it is cooked and then occasionally stirred, kept on or near the fire in order to keep it warm. And that's the world of safki. So if you can imagine now your daily activity in the indigenous South, um, as you get hungry, you're constantly coming back from wherever you are, whether you're in the fields, whether you're out hunting or whether you're mending a a fence or fixing your house, or whatever you are during the day, you are constantly coming back um, to receive sustenance of safki um, from the women of your of your village. And so this world of kunti is really different. So safki is corn, and it is what we can call a stew, what the ethnocentric or racist folks who are coming in the early 1600s, they always call it gruel, um, right? They're, they're not very... Um, praiseworthy of what of what Safi was, but they are equally fascinated and not very impressed with Kunti. Um, for many, many years, anthropologists called Kunti a famine food because no one would eat it unless they were desperately hungry. Um, and the Spanish in the early 1600s and late 1500s weren't very praiseworthy of it either. But Kunti is the bulbous roots of this plant that literally goes back to dinosaur days. Some people call it a dinosaur plant. It has been around for thousands upon thousands of years. Um, and it is ubiquitous where I live in Tallahassee because um, it's really drought resistant and like zero scapers like to plant it because it's really, really hardy. Um, but I'll show you a map in a little bit where it grows in Florida, but it grows throughout much of Florida. And in the 1500s, early 1500s, Spaniards noticed that the Indians on the east coast of Florida, down near what is Miami today, the Tequesta, they would dig up the plant, they would take the root, they would scrape it to take the root, kind of like you would scrape like a horseradish and make it into like this mash. And then they would strain it, mash it some more, 
and then strain it and strain it and strain it and strain it many, many, many times, and they would make a flower out of it. Um, one of the Spaniards who had was held captive amongst the Decesta for many years when he was released, he explained they made bread of their roots, which is their common food, the greater part of the time. So for the Tequesta and the Tecaloosa on the West Coast, Southwest Coast, which is now, say, Naples up until almost to Tampa, um, they ate Kunti along with seafood as kind of the heart of what they did for their diet. So Kunti was the raw ingredient. The bread was the recipe. So if you can imagine now, Safki, corn is the ingredient, and Safki is the recipe. Kunti is the functional equivalent of corn in this way, because you can take corn and you can thicken it, put it in stews to thicken it. But for the most part, they make it into a bread in the 1500s and in the 1600s. So as we move forward in time, we have countless images and countless observations of seminal men and seminal women eating kunti. Um, it's one of the things that anthropologists and ethnographers, when they come to Florida to learn about the Seminoles and they expect to see creeks, they discover that they're seeing something that is slightly different. So if you look at the picture on the top, if you look near the bottom, here I'll use my little cursor if you can see that. This is a scrape, oops, this is a scraper. So they would take the root and they would scrape and scrape like a grater like you would do for a Parmesan cheese or shredding carrots, but a really, really big one. And they would scrape and they would scrape and they would scrape until they had this mash underneath. And on your right-hand side, those tarps, this is what they would strain it in. They would put it on the top and they would take as much fresh water as they could and they would flush it um, multiple times because without the flushing, um, there's a toxin in Kunti, and it is will make you remarkably sick. Um, so I've heard um, from multiple folks that the magic number is eight times. Um, I don't know if that has any sort of special significance, but certainly they're thinking that four is not enough, but better err on the side at least of being cautious. Um, and after multiple rinses, we now have something that is a food that is a flower. So here are two maps. So on your right is where botanists have discovered Kunti to grow historically, naturally in Florida. It now can grow pretty much anywhere in Florida or does grow anywhere in Florida. But historically, this is where we can say all the shaded areas is where Kunti grew naturally, say as of 1700. Um, now this is a blow up map of basically here, the south half of Florida from about basically right here south. And all the little circles here are camps of Seminoles in 1930. And they basically take this route. There are a couple of camps here, and then there are camps throughout here. This would be Brighton, Big Cypress. This would be the Trail Indians, which would become the Miccosukee. Uh, down here is Miami. That's the Miami River. This is where the Tequesta would be. This would be the Calusa. And so what we discover is that where the Seminole set up their camps isn't necessarily random and may have a large bit to do with where Kunti grew naturally. So here's where, like, at one point there are camps, um, and then the camps get reified by the United States and turned into reservations. Some or lots of Native people saw their lands constricted even more than beforehand. Um, and if you, especially if you cross off Hollywood and Tampa, which are relatively recently occupied, and you look at Brighton, Immokalee, Big Cypress as the three largest reservations, those are all areas where Kunti not only grew, but grew plentiful um, in the 1800s when these areas were um, first associated with these individuals although they had ancestors there beforehand. So as we move now forward here, let me just back up and talk a little bit more about, about Safki for a second. Um, so Safki is created by women. They go out into the fields and they harvest corn. They bring it back into their village and they um, have it, they crack it and they boil it and they create Safki. 
Kunti works remarkably similarly. For the most part, women are going out and they're harvesting these roots. They're bringing it back. They're the ones doing the scraping as men in Florida are hunting deer, but also alligator and manatee and other animals. Women are in charge of harvesting. They are going out just as they used to harvest perhaps huckleberries or acorns or other products like that. They would harvest these roots. They would bring it back to the camp. They would process it, scrape, soak, strain, and then turn it to flour, and then they would make it into the breads. Um, so in many ways, right, the ingredient and the recipe are changing. That we indeed have like a, a, a soup, a thick soup, being replaced by a bread in these two different worlds. As we move closer to the present, this starts changing really in interesting ways. And this is where I want to like kind of stop for a little bit and, and, and try to lay this out a little bit. So if Safki is a recipe and Kunti is an ingredient, in the seminal context, these things start blurring. So, right, from Lake Okeechobee South in Florida, or just north of Lake Okeechobee South, corn does not grow readily. Um, in lots and lots of gardens that we see, seminoles are growing corn. Uh, but there's a difference between growing corn in one's garden and growing corn in corn fields. Gardens are smaller, gardens augment one's diet, um, where fields can be the base of one's diet. And in Florida, right, the Seminoles who still celebrate a green corn ceremony gives tremendous symbolic significance to corn. Um, corn ceases to be the central food that Seminoles eat all the time. By 1800, observers of the Seminoles are saying they see corn, uh, but just as but cattle is slowly replacing deer in Florida, um, Kunti starts replacing corn. Now it can't replace corn in its most ceremonial ways. It can't replace corn at the green corn ceremony, but they start looking for ways to take the recipe of Safki and turn it into something that you can use local ingredients, right? If we're thinking of this idea of farm to table, the ecology provides your ingredients, your culture provides your recipe. The Seminoles in Florida increasingly start making Safki with ingredients that are not corn, which to outsiders seems preposterous, right? Because Safki meant corn, water, ash, baking soda. So here's a recipe taken actually a couple days ago from the Seminole Tribe's website for recipes. Their recipe that they post today um, is Safki that uses white rice. This is born of the reality in the early 20th century that lots of Seminoles are buying dry goods from Miami and other places like that, bringing it home and then they're turning it much the same way that lots of home chefs, they go to the grocery store, they bring it home and they figure out based on how I understand how food goes together, this is how I make it. But increasingly, Seminoles are not just using white rice, they're also using kunti, um, right? So the idea of a kunti safki, which, which becomes known as safki stew or kunti stew, um, becomes this ubiquitous product in seminal society that this is what, on a daily basis, this is what Seminoles ate. Now, if they had corn, they would add corn or they would use corn, but corn um, in wetlands is not quite the same. Now, if you could also imagine the Seminoles are on the move for much of the 19th century, their, their homes are constantly um, being invaded, they're at war with the United States, basically on and off for over 60 years. Uh, Cornfields require a tremendous amount of time uh, to cultivate. Kunti fields are wild, probably a fact I should have mentioned earlier. Kunti is not something that is planted. Kunti is something that, that grows. I mean, you can dig it out and replant it, but it's not agriculture. It's closer to gathering than it is and, and harvesting um, than it is to planting. And so they are looking for large kunti plants to dig up um, and it requires them to travel or to have it growing pretty close to where they are. So here we now go back to the very earliest part of the question that I was asking of who the Seminoles are and trying to get them to, um, us to imagine 
um, them being both newcomers and old comers to the peninsula of Florida. I'm gonna back this up to here. So how do Seminoles learn how to process this very dangerous, poisonous, bulbous root? Like what leads them to, to this process? So the handful of individuals who I've spoken with at the tribe have all told me that this, they learned this from the people who were here first. They learned this from their ancestors. Um, they don't say necessarily to Kesta or Calusa, but I think the answer for me is pretty clear. Indeed, Creek migrants find their way into Florida and they meet up with individuals who are here already, their ancestors or other ancestors. And the Tecusta and the Tequesta, excuse me, and the Calusa ancestors who have been scraping and grinding and straining to make breads for hundreds of years, if not longer, they teach this technology to their new kin, to their new neighbors. Um, and their new neighbors come in not just with the idea of bread, uh, but they come in the idea what, what they really want to do is not make bread, but they would really much like to do is recreate Sofki, right? Sofki is not just a food. Sofki is kind of the cornerstone of daily life, right? Bread works differently than a stew in terms of how you eat it. Um, and so Sofki, in terms of this kind of this ritual coming back and forth to the pot throughout the day, by altering and moving away from corn, whether it becomes rice or Sofki, the pantry of South Florida uh, meets the grammar or the recipe of Sofki. Um, and this is how we wind up with something that is, um, let's just say, unique. So... When people ask me, where do the Seminoles come from? Um, I always say that they're from the native South, um, but more precisely than that, they have roots in indigenous Florida. And part of it is that food for me allows us to understand that when the newcomers, these Creeks find their way into territory that they had never been at before, they meet up with and become part of the community of people who are already here. That doesn't mean that they become Tequesta, or it certainly doesn't mean they become Calusa, right? They are seminal. Um, but what seminal means is kind of a ecological adaptation to the pantry of South Florida. They innovate culturally based on new needs and new opportunities. And there are also cultural holdovers from both the Tequesta, the Calusa, as well as their Creek ancestors, which allows us to imagine today Kunti Sofki as being kind of a, a nod to both their native South as well as their indigenous Florida roots. Um, but it might also allow us to understand um, this other curiosity that I can't quite explain is that when Seminoles today make fry bread, like many other native groups in the United States, they don't use Kunti like their ancestors would have. They use flour, right? So Kunti has taken on this new alternative means separated from the original um, interpretation or, or original use. Um, I would be remiss before I end to say, if you want to know more about the Florida Seminole, um, there are lots of good books out there, but I would go to the atatiki.com. Um, that's the Museum of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. They have lots of great information on there. Um, most of it is written for the public. Most of it's about trying to disabuse lots of myths that are out there, but they also have a great archive. Much of it has been digitized and I would urge you to take advantage of that. So I look forward to hearing some questions and, and the conversation that ensues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. And Kunti is definitely a curious case and it can tell us so much about, like you said, the Florida Seminole, but also um, how all of these communities in the native South uh, are interconnected. Um, before we begin, I just wanna say, um, this is a pre-recorded uh, presentation. And so normally this is a moment when we would ask the audience to send in their questions. Um, we still encourage you to submit questions to the comments. We will be happy to come back and try to answer them as best we can. Um, but also Dr. Frank has said that if you have any questions, you can feel free to email him at afrank at fsu.edu. So uh, if you have some burning questions, make sure you uh, ask Dr. Frank those questions. So to begin with, I mean, I, I, 
I had never really heard about Kunti until you first proposed um, this talk. And uh, I'd, I'd heard about Sufki and I've heard about all these other things, but um, Kunti was this really interesting uh, other food that you talked about and, and just the how the knowledge is passed down. Um, and this transition between corn and then going to Kunti in Florida, I'm interested to know, you know, in Creek tradition, in all these other ones, you have these oral stories that focus around corn, the origin of corn, how it was passed down. Are there any similarities in Seminole culture? Is there any kind of oral stories about uh, the origins of Kunti? So there are. Um, they don't take on the same symbolic importance. That, like, it never supersedes this symbolism of corn. So kunti becomes a really important ingredient. It doesn't become this analogous function of corn, um, right? So there's a, um, the Seminoles in 19, I think it was 1920s, were recorded of having a Calusa corn dance, right? Uh, uh, they're, they're dancing at green corn ceremony, a dance that they named for the Calusa, this group that theoretically was extinct. They call it a corn dance, but there's no Kunti dance, right? So it doesn't enter in the same way in the ideological, cosmological understanding of who they are as a people, but it comes a really important product, um, right? So I think the, the the closest equivalent would be probably another food that very few of us have eaten, which is swamp cabbage, um, right? Seminoles are living in an environment that is, that, that is unique, right? The Everglades have multiple environments within it, but there are products in there that most folks just throughout the native South, they wouldn't have opportunity to eat. And so born out of this opportunity um, comes a whole series of ingredients that becomes part of their, of their livelihood. And so we don't have like, so there are stories that they tell about the origins of Kunti and there are multiples and they disagree with one another there. So there isn't this unified sense of like, if you read about Cherokee, they have a very particular, shared understanding of how women and corn and life are connected. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that in the same way that we have for Kun. So if the if the Tequesta and the Calusa had that ages ago, that hasn't been passed on or if it's been passed on, it certainly hasn't been shared. Okay. So that's interesting. So it's kind of it's more of a necessity than a, a ceremonial kind of, you know, right. mo part of them. Um, so I know you said that it's not kind of a truly like agricultural pursuit. It's not like corn or squash or beans where you're taking it and planting it. But do you see any moment where they are trying to kind of tend to the Kunti or, or even without agriculture, there's there's a kind of manipulation of the land, right? Burning of forests, you know, cranberry bogs, things like that we see in Native America. Is there any attempt to try to kind of control the Kunti? So I've heard... I, mean, I think there's two ways. One, I think they are building their camps where Kunti is naturally growing. Um, and it's clear from the descriptions of white folks who are observing what they're doing, they're only harvesting um, Kunti that is really large. So they're certainly, um, they're not harvesting Kunti to the point of extinction, right? So they're cultivating in such a way as that young, smaller versions are remaining there. Um, I might, could have said this earlier, but this comes to an end in many ways for large parts of Florida in the early 20th century when um, pioneers come into Florida, white settlers come into Florida, and they start turning Kunti into products of their own. And so Kunti flower plants are this huge industry out of South Florida, and that further pushes Seminoles into the interior of Florida and away from the coast, right? Because they're their form of livelihood that would bring them to the coast um, as, as you would like hunt Kunti, if you can use such an expression, as they like, go out hunting looking for it. Um, their ability to do so safely along the coast disappears. Uh, but there was enough of it in the interior that they were okay when it came to Kunti. Uh, Something else. So this is really focused on also women and women's roles. So it's not just the food itself, but it's also kind of leading into, you know, women's place in Seminole Creek and, and kind of Southeastern uh, Native society. Um, and can you explain more about why women were responsible for food in these indigenous societies? Well, I think it comes down to that women were in charge of households. Um, they were in charge of like daily life um, or the daily routines of life were determined by the role of women. So elder women in a community were the most significant person within 
a village if we're talking about Creek society, but we're, if we're talking in Florida, we're often talking about what we'll call camps, significantly smaller. And so outsiders would say, this is Billy Harjo's camp. But if you look closely, it's not Billy Harjo's camp, it's probably his wife's camp and he's a guest there. And so for, as I understand it, this is like, not only are they producing the food, but actually the delivery of the food, right? The serving of the food, like taking the ladle, it's kind of this, this, I don't know, a multi-day or many times a day ritual where women are at the core of what's going on, um, right? And so, um, right, this this allows them to govern the pace of what's going on. It allows them to understand who's doing what during the day, um, right? The, the, the social realities as well, the economic or the political realities that are going on within within their within their camp, um, right? So. We often in the West imagine servers as doing grudge work, um, right? They're the ones who are providing a service to someone else. Uh, but I think the ability to serve softy to other people um, is one that is distinguished rather than one that is servile. So you see, when we just opened this, and you might have heard in our announcements, we just opened uh, um, an exhibit about women's suffrage, right? Mm -hmm. And something I find very interesting is as we're looking through a lot of the political cartoons for that, uh, you'll see them frequently kind of referring to Native American women in, in these kind of positive terms, like they are equals politically, they were in control of their destiny, and kind of like hearkening back to that. Um, do you see that this kind of place with over food gives women that political power? Or do you think that that's um, kind of a, a generalization that we've kind of imagined for for Native American women in the past? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I, mean, I think I think often, I think it's very easy to see Seminole or indigenous women in the South as having very different access to power, say in 1800 than white women would have had in St. Augustine or pick a, a town in the United States, um, right? So they, they have a different access to power, um, but they weren't in control of everything either, um, right? So we often um, imagine people in the United States, those who are in control, like the Secretary of War or Secretary of State, uh, right? Those types of positions were almost always in the hands of, of men um, mm -hmm. in indigenous communities as well. So there were some women that would rise up and play roles of diplomats, but for the most part, this was, that was a male world. And so um, I can understand why the suffragists are looking to other cultures to say, this, this isn't fated. Men aren't fated to rule. Men aren't fated to make all the decisions. And we can look to these other communities and say, look, they do it differently. But sometimes differently isn't the inverse. It's just different. Um, and so I think the suffragists attempt was to see it as the inverse. Um, Hard to blame them. <laughs> exactly. No, I, I think that it's just interesting to kind of, when you learn about a society who works very differently from your own, uh, so I think sometimes you can imbue that society with like this kind of, oh, yeah, well, it was, was idyllic or. Right, and the opponents of suffrage said, this is the natural way of things. Exactly. And so if you could find something that it looks natural, and Indians are always associated with nature, look, they're the natural people and they're doing it differently. So maybe like, maybe it isn't natural. Like, uh, but it certainly is still like you, like you were saying that like there is this kind of moment where, uh, especially in the southeast, um, seeing this kind of access to to a power or a uh, avenue that women uh, in Europe and in Euro America didn't have at the time. That's right. Um, and so I think that that's kind of still it's interesting that they're making that imagery. Um, yeah, well, so, women have access to divorce or marriage in a way of choice or sex in general outside of marriage. They had like choices that would be not just frowned upon, but make you an outcast elsewhere. Exactly. Um, and so they had, to, and the ability to provide enough food to survive um, is really important. So like, if you can imagine, you can live on corn, acorns and squash and beans by itself. You can't live on deer by itself. And so there is an exchange going on there, but women have a tremendous amount of power just on the like on the nutrition side. Forget the then you add like the cultural part of it. It's a tremendous amount of power. Definitely. That's a great point because you know, 
women were the agriculturalists and and they were kind of the that so much of agriculture and so much of where the food comes from is the backbone of any society you know and so there's all these other things that are important for society it's not just the only thing but it definitely is where you're getting your dinner from is right. <laughs> is an important thing uh and i think that you really illustrated that that well in here now is that something that's kind of exclusive to this region? Uh, or are there other, you know, Native American groups around the continent uh, that are, are doing that? Or is it just a variety? I mean, I think it's a variety, but I think the idea of women controlling fields is not, it's not peculiar to the South. I think it's a defining trait of the South, right? You can't understand the South without that. Uh, but there are other parts of North America where that's the case as well. So it's not peculiar in that way. Um, I, I, I more see it as the inside out rather than the outside in. Uh, but certainly there are other matrilineal communities out there. Um, but the Southeast was particularly um, particularly bound to agriculture in a way that say the Northeast, there was some agriculture in the Northeast and there are cornfields, um, but also the commitment of communities to move and hunt of game is different in the Northeast um, and parts say, of New England than say it is in the American style. Um, so it's a different balance um, of where they're getting their food and, and the symbolism that they use in their ceremonies. Um, same for the Southwest. Perfect. So one final question for you, and this is kind of a, maybe more of a fun one. Is uh, Kunti flour available for people to be able to purchase it and use it? Yes. Um, they sold it my Whole Foods. Yeah, really? Yeah, well, so it's gluten-free, so it's available. Um, it's a little bitter. So I should probably add this. Kunti is not eaten very often today amongst the Seminoles. When you asked, I meant to say this before, when you asked about, did it take on the symbolic role? It never really did. It performed a functional role. And now, for the most part, Seminoles, most of their daily meals will look very much like your meal or my meal, right? When they get together for cultural ceremonies and they're trying to eat as their ancestors did, or in some sort of, they're eating safki and they tend to eat safki, usually corn, but they add guava to it. And like, mm -hmm. and so it, like, so they've made it something that is them. And they eat fry bread in these moments, even though that's really a very modern, modern food. But Kunti, like I was talking to one gentleman um, and I described, I said, so I've never had Kunti. And I said, is it really as bad as they say? He says, no, it's not so bad. I don't have it very often. When I have it, I like it. Right, so, so so he wasn't insulted when I said like he's <laughs> very good, but he also wasn't like insistent that I go out and try it. Um, but no, they sell it at lots of natural markets. Whole Foods has it. Um, often it's called zamia, or it's called kunti, or it's arrowroot. Uh, but if you look at the ingredients, they're all the same. Perfect. So people can now that they've heard about it, they can go and experiment and try and see if, if they like it. Right, and so if there's a run on it in your local store, you know why. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, I just want to put your email up here again if anyone has a question for Dr. Frank. Um, and thank everyone for joining us today. And remember to join us again for our virtual gallery talk on September 28th at noon Central Standard Time. And it'll be right here on Facebook and YouTube.